we're always talking about dual channel memory configs, and to be honest, we kind of take it for granted nowadays. It's because most conventional motherboards in 2018 are set up to support dual channel memory out of the box. All you need is a pair of DDR3 or 4 modules, and to avoid pulling a verge and placing them in the wrong slots like this. That's literally all it takes to enable dual channel support. It's super simple. But what if we stripped a solid gaming PC of this feature? Would the average gamer or content creator even notice a difference between dual and single channel memory configurations? We're gonna find out in this video. Cable Mod's vertical PCIe kits are back in stock, meaning you'll have the opportunity to trick out your rig and swing that graphics card sideways for a unique look that's sure to impress your fellow PC gamers. The bracket itself is extremely durable and easy to assemble, the included riser cable is sturdy and reliable, and the included display cables are custom and solid. Okay, I'm running out of adjectives now. Snag one while you can on Cable Mod's online store via the link below. The tests we'll conduct in this video are straightforward. I've got my personal rig behind me, it's the one I use for both gaming and content creation. I'll keep two modules in here. These are G-Skill Triton z dim supporting a frequency of three gigahertz, which will run out for the duration of this video. For the first set of tests, we'll gather our baseline data by running everything in dual channel mode. It looks like this. This is what you'd expect most people to currently run. And then I'll slide one of the modules into an adjacent slot that breaks the dual channel memory config. In the case of this motherboard, slots A1 and B1 are optimal for dual channel, so running our second set of tests with RAM in slots A1 and A2, gosh this is cringy, should keep us on a single channel. Now after running through the data, we'll circle back and discuss why we saw what we saw and go into more detail as to what dual channel configurations actually do for a system. These here are the system specs, the benchmarking rig, I guess you could call it. Uh, all games, by the way, are loaded from a two terabyte hard drive, 7200 RPM, it's a Toshiba drive. This format is indicative of what I imagine a majority of gamers out there currently have. So starting with those games, Grand Theft Auto V give us approximately 137 FPS on average in the high preset in the dual channel config and a mere 110 in a uh, single channel. This is honestly not what I was expecting. I had seen many articles testing this very game and concluding that the channeling was virtually irrelevant, right? Single channel versus dual channel doesn't really matter for this game. That's definitely not the case, at least from my own testing, and I ran these tests multiple times to confirm. I imagine the CPU is being forced to keep up with faster draws from the graphics card. At lower resolutions, the GPU can render frames significantly faster, shifting that bottle Next to our CPU. I created a frame time graph for this game as well so you can see the trend over time for both runs. At a few places the two perform similarly, uh, but the dual channel config renders frames significantly faster for a solid chunk of this benchmark. Up next, Ashes of the Singularity, pretty much just a benchmark game at this point, proves to be even worse of a candidate for single channel memory configurations. Frame rate drops by as much as 40% were seen across the board. I ran this one a few times more than usual to make sure that my results were consistent. I even tried a single stick of RAM just to make sure it had nothing to do with the way I was stacking the RAM and the motherboard. And yes, the frequencies were locked to three gigahertz before and after. I imagine this has a lot to do with the DX12 API, which we predicted long ago would leverage more of the CPU in an effort to maximize parallel Parallelism. That word gets me every time. Parallelism. More on DX12 in this video right here. Now, diving further into this theory, I tested Shadow of the Tomb Raider in DirectX 12 as well, and was <laughs> rather relieved to see that our fr frame rate drop wasn't as substantial this time around. 101 versus 71, that's still pretty substantial, but not as bad as before, with a mere 8 FPS split among our lowest 0.1% of frames drawn. Assassin's Creed Odyssey was a much better story, though the frame rates across the board were still significantly lower in the very high preset. 66 versus 56 is definitely noticeable on average, and then 36 versus 31 down low. Not as bad, uh, but the percentage difference there between the frame rates is still very consistent. Lastly, F1 2017 pumped out a sweet 119 FPS. This game always performs well, especially with NVIDIA graphics cards in the dual channel configuration, dropping by a mere 13 FPS in single channel. Similar margins were reserved for the lowest 1% and 0.1% of frames drawn, by the way, as well. Uh, so not as bad with F1 2017, but across the board we did see a dip in frame rates, which again is contrary to a lot of the online sort of like website reviews of single versus dual channel memory configurations. I'm not sure why a lot of them were getting nearly identical. For Take this one for example. I mean this guy was getting almost identical frame rates before and after the switch to single channel memory, uh, and I even tried Grand Theft Auto V, just like he did, uh, but my <laughs> margins were much wider than his. In fact, his almost looked negligible across the board. Um, so I can't speak to their results, but I can tell you 
I, I am 100% behind these benchmarks. I trust these. I triple check them, at least triple check them. And uh, yeah, this is the state of dual versus single channel memory right now. So yeah, let's uh, let's discuss the results. The gaming benchmarks can be summarized into one big, it depends. Most CPU intensive titles like Ashes of the Singularity will deviate quite a bit from a baseline dual channel config. By the way, this may vary slightly uh, on comparable AMD platforms since both companies manage memory pipelines slightly different. It, it isn't as different as it used to be, but it's still noticeable. But the gist of the story is that memory calls from the CPU are being bottlenecked, right, by a single channel. Now, in some games, you won't notice much of a difference at all. F1 2017, for example, didn't seem to care. Really, I mean, at all. <laughs> it's, there's, a, there's a difference there, but it's, it's not as substantial a difference as before. In fact, you'd be hard pressed to discern the two if I showed them side by side, that in-game uh, experience. So I imagine this will be the case for most gamers in most titles, but again, today's most intensive titles are clearly discriminating between the two configurations, which is why it's important to abide by motherboard manual recommendations. I thought it was very cool that the uh, Gigabyte Z390 Designator in my test rig warned me upon first boot that the RAM modules weren't seated in their optimal slots. This is what it looked like. Of course, it wouldn't matter if you plan on running four DIMMs at a time, but in case you happen to miss this indicator, the splash screen upon posting is a nice feature, and uh, that's sure to save you from headaches that I'm sure The Verge ran into when they first did this. Although he says that he knew what he was doing, so. Remember that system RAM's purpose is to store temporary chunks of information the CPU sees fit. The benefit here is ultra low latency and assuming you have sufficient capacity, ample storage for intensive tasks. You could in theory use something as slow as a hard drive or even a floppy disk to store all of this temporary information as much as you could, but it would require constant rewriting since the stuff's intended to be volatile. That's not good for those drives. And perhaps most importantly, calls from the CPU would take forever relatively speaking, over something like the SATA interface. Now, all dual channel configs do is double available bandwidth to the CPU, meaning any large calls for information from the RAM won't have to travel down a narrower path, at which point latency increases and frame rates drop. That's a bit of what we saw in this video. You can really think of bandwidth like a highway. The more bandwidth available, the wider the highway, meaning more cars can move freely at the same time. The cars are packets of data. That still doesn't make sense. Now, in the case of Ashes of a Singularity, where physics calculations are hammering certain parts of the CPU. Several threads were under near 100% load, especially in that resolution. We would expect dual channel memory to benefit us to an extent since instructions are typically copied to and pulled from RAM in an instant all the time. This prevents errors and data losses during that execution. Again, what really matters are the programs themselves and how they utilize resources at their disposal. Now, I know that the video title says gaming and I feel like you got a good dose of that, but I want to reveal a case in which a system can benefit from dual or quad channel memory even outside of the gaming sphere and that's content creation. Now the application in mind is Adobe Premiere. I use it a lot in my testing. I actually use it all the time for videos like these. And I'm curious to see how a simple render fares. We've got 4K footage mixed up with 1080p footage on a 10 minute uh, and a five minute timeline. And the resulting bars indicate how long in seconds the render took. And dual versus single channel memory makes Surprise, surprise. An enormous difference here. A three or so minute difference in the case of a 10 minute video render and a two minute difference in the case of a five minute render. I mean, these are, we're talking around 40% difference here in terms of just waiting for this thing to render. It would make absolutely no sense for any serious content creator to run in single channel, and this is why. In fact, many workstations sport quad channel memory configurations, which again doubles the bandwidth of dual channel. The law of diminishing returns comes in pretty handy in that case though, and is useful really for only those applications taking advantage of huge chunks of system RAM, right? Where tons of data, uh, again, picture tons of cars being pushed down a highway, you want several more lanes if you can have them. That's what quad channel does, opens those lanes up so the CPU can send and receive more information to and from the RAM in a much quicker amount of time without those latencies involved. So I hope this video at least satisfied your morbid curiosity and maybe you learned a thing or two. I know I did researching the stuff, scripting the video. Most of us with two or more modules are, are running at least dual channel, so you're probably fine, but many are still stuck with a single DIMM. So at least now you know what you're missing in some of today's newer titles, if you're sporting maybe an older board or a single mod 
module. And especially in Premiere Pro, the differences are pretty substantial. So what do you think? Are you sporting a single channel config in your own rig? Have you swapped out parts and tested on your own? Let me know in the comments below. Also, something else to note, uh, you'll find that single modules, like if you buy just a single eight gig stick, uh, it's gonna cost you a little bit more than buying two four gig sticks. The reason why is because you could buy a single eight gig stick and then pair that with like four other eight gig sticks down the line, and then you can get 32 gigs uh, out of just four modules versus if you buy four four gig modules, you're stuck with only 16. And if you have only four slots, then that's it. You max it out. So you got to sell your RAM and uh, you got to buy modules that have higher capacities. Uh, so that's why those are more expensive. It's not because they're better. Don't confuse the two. You buy two DIMMs if you can. If you can buy two eight gig sticks, 16 is plenty for gamers. It's even sufficient for a majority of content creators out there. I've <laughs> rendered a lot with 16 gigs. Uh, even scrubbing the timeline isn't too bad, although having more is never really gonna hurt in that case. So uh, just a little bit of inside scoop there. By the way, this video here is still relevant. Uh, I know this is a couple years old at least, um, but you'll be surprised by the number of games you can get by with only eight gigs of DDR4 or DDR3, depends on the platform. Uh, so give that one a watch if you're interested. Like this video if you thought it was cool, dislike it if you feel the complete opposite. I gotta breathe. Ooh, I'm just, I'm speaking too fast and uh, I didn't I didn't think about taking a breath there. Okay, we're good. Click that red subscribe button if you haven't already, folks. I appreciate it. Merry Christmas if I don't see you before Christmas Day. And uh, I don't think we're gonna do a live stream this week, uh, but I am doing quite a number of giveaways on social media. So follow me down below, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. You still have a chance to win a pretty dope graphics card. This is Science Studio. Thanks for learning with us.